Hello my angels, I'm here with another lecture, not really a lecture, just kind of a conversation, I think it's more accurate. So I'm going to read from Giorgio Grambin's When the House Burns Down. It's a very short book, I finished it in a day, I think you could probably finish it in an hour if you wanted to. Um, it has four essays. So Agamben is an Italian philosopher. He has, I guess, a nine volume series called Homo Sacer. And I definitely want to get more of his books. I'm writing a book right now, just very slowly, like one, one day a weekend basically or one day a week i guess that would be um like on the weekends so uh, it's been really great and i definitely think i'll use this some of it um so it's four essays when the house burns down is one of the essays door and threshold and i really liked those two it seems as if he is maybe kind of critiquing the same sort of thing that Byung Chul Han critiques, which is the le the neoliberal regime, self exploitation, confusion, disorder, um, commodification, consumerism. The uh, I guess unwinding chaotic effects of our technology without which are without any sort of expectations or rituals or guidelines so it seems like he's in that camp which one of you suggested I read text from a school of thought I guess called the traditionalist which I didn't I wasn't really aware that that existed but after looking into it some and I definitely want to read some of the books. I wonder if traditionalist is a word that you could use for these writers who are not really postmodern writers. But they seem, or maybe they are, but they seem a little bit nostalgic, a little bit romantic, utopic. Um wanting to go back to a pre-modern era something in like ancient times almost so i don't know you'll have to tell me what you think lessons in the darkness and testimony and truth i found rather bland and flat i didn't write very many notes i just i don't know i kind of wish he would have stayed with the themes in the first two. I thought that they really worked well together, but yeah, I don't know. So the other book I have of the Gambins, which I would like to start soon, maybe even this evening, because I feel like I just kind of need to do some pleasure reading. I've had a good week so far, but um, I stepped in for a colleague who was out um, on Monday to teach the trickster archetype in his world mythology, which I'm going to do for my class tomorrow. But that was fun. The class was amazing. And then I had uh, such a fun time with my students on Tuesday. They are just, they have such great energy. We dipped into Greek mythology, so that's what we're doing all week. I'm using Euripides' Bacchae and the model of Dionysus as a trickster. So we're reading through some of that well, tomorrow, and then I did that on Monday. But on Tuesday, which was yesterday for me, um, we were looking at some stories in this one text that is is okay like I, I think it's good for my students just because I wanted them to get like 
a good handful of Greek myths in a short time, like very easy. I don't have the book with me because I just left it in my office because I knew I wasn't going to use it again for the rest of the semester. Um, but what we did in class was look at some myths in Ovid's Metamorphosis and they were just cracking me up. They were so... One was um, the myth of Apollo chasing Daphne and Daphne turns into a tree and oh my goodness, the comments about what um, boys shouldn't do. And then to contrast that, I had another myth um, called Biblis or surrounding Biblis, a character who is uh, like a teenage girl who is in love with her brother. And so that's a, another forbidden love, but she is, so she's trying to chase him. So it you know, and it just talks about like all her strategies and then how it just fails completely because he's disgusted with, the, her brother's disgusted with her and like flees the city and then she like f- runs into the forest and falls down on the dirt dying of shame and basically she turns into like, I can't remember, I think a lake or something. So <laughs> they were just, I had to read that to them because I couldn't find a PDF of it online. Um... Yeah, but they were just so hilarious. Anyway, so that's that's been my week, and then I had my political economy class this morning. We're finishing up um, neoliberal economics. So I realized, I should have realized this before, but I realized this today. I mean, it's been on the syllabus the whole semester. But there are stages, I guess, of economic thought. And so we started with classical economics, Adam Smith. Then we moved on to neoclassical economics, which I sort of want to find, I guess, more accessible readings. The readings that we were assigned were just really technical. And I don't think I really got much out of that section. Um, But then today we did our one day on our classes are like are they three hours I think it's around three hours um oh I have to sneeze oh my goodness my allergies today it's another windy day um although I guess it was nice out earlier so we did our one unit on neoliberal economics, which I thought that was interesting because neoliberalism is what Byung-Chul Han talks about. That's the term he uses a lot. And I guess it can be applied to economics. And we read James Buchanan, Milton Friedman, although I didn't get very far in his book at all, and Ayn Rand. So what is capitalism, which I guess I've been doing a series on. So... um, yeah, and he assigns us when we get to class, like, um, a chapter, et cetera, with, like, one other person to summarize and talk about, and so I'm so glad I got the chapter in Ayn Rand, because I really understood her. Um, well, enough to summarize <laughs> for our class. Okay, so I'm just going to read through this, share it, and maybe have some comments. But it's just really beautifully written. I don't know if all of his books are like this, but it's very artistic, experimental. It kind of reminds me of Barth's A Lover's Discourse. There is no sense in anything I do if the house burns down. And yet it is exactly while the house is burning that one must carry on as always, must do everything with care and precision perhaps even more diligently, even if no one notices. Perhaps life will disappear from earth, leaving no memory of what was done, for better or for worse. But you must carry on as before. It is too late to change. There is no more time. So it has kind of this apocalyptic feel, I guess, like maybe the point of no return. So it's, you know, so does Agamben, is he pessimistic about the state of humanity, maybe because of the environment, um, how our excessive consumerism, fetishized capitalism has ruined much of the earth, or at least damaged it, and 
so far we're not really taking great strides to fix it i mean that would be something that you know someone like ayn rand would not approve of because that would that would take the collective joining in a collaboration and she feels that all sort of tribal mind or collectivism is uh, tyranny basically like an element of tyranny she wants everyone to be individualistic even at the cost of really anything because uh, she wants to preserve the individual right to act and think as we want which I'm not sure if I know. I mean, I definitely don't agree with that. She wants freedom at all costs, and I think freedom is on a continuum. And as with anything, um, the extremes, which would be no freedom and 100% freedom, uh, are destructive. And the choice is always the middle way. The choice is always a balance. And I don't see that in her works. I did watch a small a small documentary. I don't know if I mentioned this before about Ayn Rand, but apparently she... So I'm sorry if I'm repeating it. I think that I may have mentioned it on a conversation that I ended up deleting. Um, no, I don't want to repeat it. And anyway, this is not about Ayn Rand, so... Let me know in the comments if I mentioned something about her personal life and her predatory nature um, and her narcissism. Okay, for what's going on around you is no longer your concern. Like the geography of a country that you must leave forever. And yet, in what way does it still matter to you at this very moment when it is no longer your concern, when everything seems finished, all things in all places appear in their true colors, touch you more closely somehow, just as they are, splendor and poverty. So maybe it's the, you know, idea, maybe like the Lars von Trier film, Melancholia, that Zizek and Hahn and every philosopher wants to talk about. You know, there's this, um, I guess, these four people and uh, another, like a celestial object is going to hit the earth and everything's going to die probably and they're watching it and they have sort of like this or at least one of the characters has this kind of release and this I guess salvific um, experience because of her eminent annihilation like an emptying of self and therefore resulting elation and joy it sounds akin to this to me you know um in our hopelessness like what beauty can we find what art can we find maybe that's the way forward even if it doesn't save the house from burning down. Philosophy, a dead language. The language of poets is always a dead language, oddly enough, a dead language that is used to give greater life to thought. Perhaps not a dead language, but a dialect. The fact that philosophy and poetry speak in a language that is more and less than language is the measure of their standing, of their special vitality. To weigh and judge the world by measuring it against a dialect or a dead, yet never less fresh, language where there is no need to change even a comma. Continue to speak this dialect now that the house is burning. I think this is interesting because it seems that the direction that we're going, if we go all the way, is a removal of the humanities from higher education. It seems impossible, but unless you, I mean, but if you take what people who are in charge of decisions like that are saying, then it will perhaps happen. <laughs> um, because I've had, you know, I've heard various statements from 
you know, almost the highest that you can go in higher education about, you know, if people, if the people don't demand, it's a complete neoliberal economic model. Just hearing about Milton Friedman today. Um, I don't know if he said this, but this quote was given in class that the business of business is business so like nothing else yeah i think that was freedom and um at least that was in the discussion of him where you know the the goal is the market and not social responsibility etc and uh, i think what agamben is saying here is that he is finding the necessity in what may be consumer culture would find valueless. Which house is burning? The country where you live or Europe or the whole world? Perhaps the houses, the cities have already burned down. Who knows how long ago? In a single immense blaze that we pretended not to see. Some are reduced to just bits of frame, a frescoed wall, a roof beam, names, so many names, already eaten by the flames. And yet we cover them so carefully with white plaster and false words that they seem intact. We live in houses and cities burned to the ground as if they were still standing. The people pretend to live there and go out into the streets, masked amid the ruins as if these were the familiar neighborhoods of times past. And now the form and nature of the flame has changed. It has become digital, invisible, and cold. But exactly for this reason, closer still, it encircles and envelops us at every moment. So I think Agamben here is asking, you know, what are we ignoring? What are we willfully ignoring just so we can go on as normal, live our lives, still have the same ambitions and dreams that we people might have had 50 years ago, 20 years ago. Even though our world is changing so fast, what about it are we not able to digest and so just sort of engage with, but, you know, turn a blind eye, I think is people say, um, you know, and I mean, it's a bit on the nose, I think, when he says it has become digital, but, you know, just referring to technology, and I was watching this, I think it was like an L UK or a Vogue UK about Florence Pugh. I know that she's an actress in something <laughs> so uh, she was just saying that you know she doesn't ask people not to have opinions about her because that would be unrealistic and not fair I'm guessing because she you know has elected to kind of put herself out there as an actress and a person that goes to events and gets dressed up etc and is written about um but what she doesn't really think is necessary is the environment of hate that she sees on the internet. And I looked up the definition to snarky the other day, the other week, just because I wanted to see if it meant what I thought it meant, because that's how I see the environment of the internet. But I'm thinking specifically of Twitter because Twitter is nothing but basically comments. So, but not comments on anything. Um, it's Twitter is comments without the YouTube video or the Instagram selfie. It's just statements put out there into the world and people, you know, their original posts are snarky and the comments are snarky. I'm gonna look up this word right now because it's it's so beautiful. It's a really nice word, actually. Um, and it's, it's very short. Critical or mocking in an indirect or sarcastic way. Critical or mocking in an indirect or sarcastic way. That That is what 
Oh, and look, the use o over time for snarky, it started going up around, it looks like, 2018. So <laughs> there you go. It's like, I get, or maybe that's when it was invented. I don't know. Does it say here? Oh, early 20th century. Okay, well, it didn't it didn't exist before. Um, but were, were people not critical or mocking in an indirect or sarcastic way? I don't I don't know. I think they probably were. Uh, maybe there's just another word for it. Tell me in the comments what that might be. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we're all just really unhappy or unsettled. And there are such beautiful places and beautiful gatherings. And I know I always say this, but academia for me is where I witness that people are kind and polite to each other and curious together and growing together. And it's truly a sacred space. But it is not a sacred space on most of the internet. And, I, and that's where we get to be somewhat anonymous. Even if you are you in, on social media, you get to say something even about someone but not you, that you wouldn't say to someone's face or you wouldn't say if someone else was listening to you in the, in the present. So, I'm not, I mean, I'm not judging that you know when I talk about humanity I'm just talking about all of us I mean we're not all that different so why do we do that what do we get from it civilizations barbarisms have gone under never to rise again and historians are used to marking and dating sisters and wrecks but how does one bear witness to a world that goes to its ruin with blindfolded eyes and its face covered, a republic that collapses without lucidity or pride in fear and abjection? The blindness is all the more desperate for the doomed believe they can steer their own wreck, swear that everything can be kept under control technically, that there is no need for a new god or a new heaven, merely prohibitions, experts, and doctors, pain and deceit. So I want to know more about how a gambin thinks that we're blind, maybe because we're focusing on the short term without long term effects. We're not really thinking, changing our ways, even when we kind of can't deny that you know, resources on the earth are not infinite and this valuing of profit over well-being, even in medicine, in, you know, lab practices, studying in vi virology, um, let's think, where's the R there? Um, And I mean, the list goes on. Probably we can't live like this forever. What would a God be to whom neither prayers nor sacrifices were offered? And what would be a law? What would a law be that knew neither command nor execution? And a word that neither signified nor commanded, but held itself truly in the beginning, indeed before the beginning. A culture that feels itself to be at the end with no life left, does what it can to govern its ruin through a permanent state of exception. The total mobilization in which Ernst Jünger saw the essential character of our time must be seen from this perspective. People must be mobilized, must at all times feel themselves to be in a condition of emergency, regulated in the minimum details by those who have the power to decide on the emergency. But while in the past mobilization had the goal of bringing people closer, today it aims to isolate and distance them from one another. How long has the house been burning? How long ago did it burn down? 
Certainly a century ago, between 1914 and 1918, something happened in Europe that threw everything that still seemed whole and alive into the flames of madness. Then once again, 30 years later, the blaze broke out everywhere and since then has not ceased to burn without pause, quietly barely visible below the ashes. But perhaps the fire began long before that, when humanity's blind drive towards salvation and progress joined with the power of fire and of machines. This is all well known and need not be repeated. Rather, we must ask ourselves how we continue to live and think while everything burned. Ask what remained somehow whole at the center of the blaze or at its edges. How were we able to breathe amid the flames? What did we lose? What piece of wreckage or what illusion did we cling to? And now that there are no longer flames, but only numbers, figures, and lies, we are certainly weaker and more alone, but with no possible compromises, lucid like never before. I think that's an interesting reference to the information age, how what's, what innovation is like heading toward or focused on already there, really not heading toward. Um, you know, when you think about when you think about AI, when you think about apps, um, just technology, Silicon Valley, marketing, um, data collected on psychological profiles of consumers. I mean, it's all sort of about the algorithm, about measuring, about quantifying in this abstract, almost like post-material way. And I think that he is referencing that and the idea that there are no longer flames, you know, makes me think of Foucault's understanding and articulation of power that is subtle and almost imperceptible and therefore more dangerous and more effective. If it is only in the house in flames that the fundamental architectural problem becomes visible, then you can now see the stakes of the story of the West, what it sought to grasp at all costs and why it was destined to fail. It is as if power sought at all costs to seize whole of the bare life it has produced, and yet as much as it tries to appropriate and control it with every possible apparatus, no longer just the police, but also medicine and technology, bare life cannot but slip away, since it is by definition ungraspable. Governing bare life is the madness of our time. People reduced to their pure biological existence are no longer human. The government of people and the government of things co coincide. So that's why I think I was making a connection with Byung Chul Han, because he talks about bare life and how we we apply that the algorithm measurement and collecting information and data abstracting ourselves to our bodies you know i think about brian johnson and i'm not critiquing him but he seems like he fits in this example as maybe a really rich extreme version of what the rest of us are doing or a lot of us are doing you know he's using science and he's using his body to try to turn back time to become like his 18 year old son in all of the ways he can possibly do that with exercise and sleep and meditation and supplements like he takes 100 supplements a day and uh, I mean, I think it's it's interesting, and we all want to be healthier, I think, and maybe not necessarily live longer just to live longer, but live well, increase our the quality of living as we live longer. And, you know, stopping the process of aging to a great degree. So... Again, I don't judge what he's doing, but what Byung Chul Han is critiquing, and maybe a Gambin, is that we're not thinking about the cost. What are we 
deciding not to do when we're focusing on being so controlling of our body. You know, when sort of the mechanistic age of science came in to apply itself to nature, just thinking about like Francis Bacon, for instance, we wanted to tame and control nature. Our bodies, we are a part of nature, and now the focus is on our bodies and, and ourselves. And I've been victim to that too. And, uh, you know, he's talking about the isolation. We're spending so much of our time on technology. And of course, places in various parts of the world are going to be different. I mean, he is Italian, so I'm guessing he's observing his own country and people in Western Europe. And I'm coming from a perspective in the U.S., and uh, I think it's just hard to say. Um, I don't necessarily think that everything we are and everything we're doing is heading towards self-destruction. Although I do wish that we would be a people who would be more cautious and slow and consider the costs. And I don't agree with everything in the direction concerning that we're going but I feel that it's just so hard to say and see because we're in the middle of the change you know in 50 or 100 years looking back I mean who knows what that will be like but maybe it won't be so chaotic maybe there is a time that's coming that will stabilize and seem you know people will feel grounded again certain loose ends and questions will resolve people will evolve in some way you know psychically i think in all historical eras of great change that sort of apocalyptic mindset enters in So do we take it seriously this time or not? The other house, the one in which I will never be able to live, but which is my true house, the other life, the one I did not live while I believed I was living it, the other language which I spelled out syllable by syllable without ever being to speak it, being able to speak it, so much mine that I will never be able to have them. When thought and language are divided, we believe it possible to speak while forgetting we are speaking. Poetry and philosophy, while they say something, do not forget that they are speaking. They remember language. If we remember language, if we do not forget that we can speak, then we are freer. Not confined to things and rules. Language is not a tool. It is our face, the open in which we are. I thought that first paragraph about the other house the one in which I will never be able to live but which is my true house is so sad <laughs> maybe that's you know our fantasy is that's what our hope is for the future but we're already you know from a Gambin's perspective like past the possibility of it the face is the most human thing the human has a face and not simply a muzzle or a snout because we dwell in the open because in our faces we expose ourselves and communicate. This is why the face is the place of politics. Our impolitical time does not want to see its own face. It keeps it at a distance, masks up, and covers it. There must be no more faces, only numbers and figures. Even the tyrant is faceless. To feel oneself living, to be affected by one's own sensibility, to be delicately given over to one's own gesture, yet unable to assume it or avoid it. Feeling myself living makes my life possible, even if I were closed up in a cage. And nothing is so real as this possibility. In the coming years, there will only be monks and delinquents. And yet it is not possible simply to draw oneself aside, to believe one can pull oneself out from underneath the rubble of the world that has collapsed around us. 
for the collapse matters to us and calls to us. We too are only a piece of that rubble and we will cautiously have to learn to use it in a more just way without being noticed. I think that's so interesting. In the coming years, there will only be monks and delinquents. Some people will try to retreat into a calm, isolated space of contemplation and others will be restless and, you know, via their adrenaline react to the chaos in a more, like, I guess, active and almost destructive way, perhaps, or more frenzied way. And I think that's interesting. Are there other alternatives in which will you be? I already know I'm the monk. <laughs> growing old, growing only in the roots, no longer in the branches. Sinking down into the roots when there are no longer flowers or leaves, or rather like a drunken butterfly flitting about what has been lived through. There are still branches and flowers in the past, and you can still make honey of them. The face is in God, but bones are atheist. Outside, everything pushes us towards God. Inside, the stubborn, mocking atheism of the skeleton. The fact that the soul and body are indissolubly conjoined, this is spiritual. The spirit is not a third term between the soul and the body. It is only their helpless, wonderful co coinciding. Biological life is an abstraction, and it is this abstraction that we presume to govern and take care of. I think that's interesting, looking at the spirit as how the soul and body communicates with each other. There can be no salvation for us as individuals. There is salvation because there are others. And this is not for moral reasons, not because I should act for their good, only because I am not alone is there salvation. I can be saved only as one among many, as an other among others. Alone, and this is the special truth of solitude, I do not need salvation. Indeed, I am properly unsavable. Salvation is the dimension that opens because I am not alone, because there is a plurality and a multitude. Becoming incarnate, God ceased to be unique. He became a man among many. This is why Christianity had to bind itself to history and follow its fortunes to the end. And when history dies out and decays as today seems to be happening, Christianity too draws near to its end. Its unhealable contradiction is that it sought in history and through history a salvation beyond history. And when this ends, the ground beneath its feet disappears. In truth, the church was allied not with salvation, but with the history of salvation. And since it sought salvation through history, it could not but end in health. And when the moment came, it did not hesitate to sacrifice salvation to health. We must pry salvation from its historical context, find a plurality that is not historical, a plurality as a way out of history. To exit from one place or situation without entering into other territories, to leave an identity and a name without taking on others. We can only move backwards toward the present, well, in the past, we walk directly on. What we call the past is nothing but our long backwards movement toward the present. Separating us from our past is the first resource of power. So I guess I would ask, you know, on these couple of pages, or point out that I think it's interesting that salvation is connected to the collective here there is no individual salvation and i think that that idea is very prominent in spiritual communities um where it's not just you get the sense that you know as an individual if you're following a spiritual path and you're meditating and you're asking or i guess seeking a higher consciousness or an evolution you get the feeling that it's you have to bring everyone else with you like you have to to ask that and seek that for everyone because it's it's all of us going forward or it's no one 
Um, so it isn't an individual salvation at all. And then I would ask, you know, why does a gambin think history is dying out? What does that mean? Um, I, I genuinely don't really have a deep insight on what he means about that. I know he's talking about the past at the same time. You know, so why is it destructive to live in the past? I mean, I know what the contemplatives and the spiritual say. Um, I guess maybe we retreat to the past thinking it's still the present, but the present is not. We are no longer what we are or what we used to be. But I'm still not sure how that relates to history, so if anyone has an idea. What frees us from weight is breath. In breath, we no longer weigh anything. We are pushed along as if in flight beyond the force of gravity. Actually, I think I'm going to stop there. There's just a few more pages, but I just always get the feeling when <laughs> I should stop. Because um, I like to really be indulgent and like absolutely love what I'm doing, but then I get tired easily. <laughs> so, so we'll definitely finish this and I think move on to the door and the threshold, which I absolutely love. Thank you all for joining with me and listening to me. If you have any comments on Agamben's first essay, let me know. <laughs>